don't see the red light. Cool. Mm -hmm. Hello, and welcome to Methodist Debakey CV Live. Uh, I'm Eric Peden. I'm a vascular surgeon at Houston Methodist, and I'm joined by my partner, Alan Lumsden. We are both vascular surgeons here working in Houston, Texas, and we thought it was salient to bring uh, to light some of the issues surrounding dialysis access during the COVID crisis as we're all experiencing it now. Uh, there are lots of controversies and different directions that were being given and different guidelines that are being issued. So we pulled together a panel of experts from around the country who uh, can give us their viewpoints and insights into things that are happening both in our local, regional, and then national levels. Um, we're blessed to be joined today by uh, specialists from different uh, groups, including nephrology, surgery, radiology, and also some people from the large dialysis organizations, in particular DaVita is going to be represented today. Uh, because of time constraints, actually, uh, Dr. David Van Wick is going to go uh, first with uh, a talk about uh, DaVita's approach to this. Uh, Dr. Van Wick is vice president of um, uh, one of the vice presidents at uh, DaVita, and he's tasked with the COVID response task force, and leading that is the nephrology uh, part of that. Uh, so, David, perhaps you'd like to talk to us about um, what's going on inside of DaVita and where we're at from historical point up until now and, and where we're headed. You bet. Thank you, Eric, uh, and, and thanks, folks, for, um, for the time today. Uh, let me give you a little background on, on how we approach this uh, as DaVita, but also as the, uh, as the dialysis industry. As you know, the dialysis industry is, is well-coordinated and uh, well-regulated. We're, we're used to working closely together, uh, and since the onset of uh, this pandemic, uh, we have been uh, deliberately collaborating both at a, at a formal uh, level uh, between task forces in, in different groups, uh, but also uh, at the national level in a group called uh, CASER Kidney Care Emergency Response Group. It's a, a CMS contracted um, emergency response collaboration team and puts everybody together on a daily call. The, the dimensions of the problem that we are dealing with here are, of course, um, that our patients and our team come in from the communities where they are exposed and they come into a dialysis setting and then go home. And in particular for the patients on this side, it means that they are continuously exposed at, in the community um, and, uh, and then come into the facility in different, in different conditions to, um, because the symptoms are so difficult to define, uh, uh, the, it, it means that, uh, that you have to assume that everybody is symptomatic. You can't just say, um, this is a cough that's an allergy, this is a cough that is potentially COVID, that doesn't work very well. Uh, we found that out uh, very, very early. Um, and then uh, the second, of course, is the unavailability of testing on the one hand, and then the testing uh, for uh, real-time PCR uh, has a significant false negative rate, and the worst thing that can happen is to have a false negative in the facility uh, unprotected. So, um, so as an industry, uh, what you can see happening across the industry right now and, and for the last several weeks, is screening at the front door for everybody who who comes to the front door, whether that is a patient or a healthcare worker or a driver or a delivery person. Nobody gets in that facility until they're screened first. And a screen positive uh, result then gets escalated before the pay that person gets into the facility. Step two is the, is, is a universal use of uh, of uh, barrier precautions, so uh, uh, masking uh, at, at the door for everybody who comes through the door, um, and and that is uh, that that's universal. So what that does basically is to provide a barrier to both um, the discharge of droplets and uh, and the acquisition of droplet-borne uh, disease on unwashed hands. In the, in, within the, the treatment floor, then, um, all of the, in 
infection control procedures that are in place are designed around barrier precautions, are designed around the uh, around not placing infected hands in the nose or mouth. So again, everybody's, everyone has masks, both the patients and those who are caring for the patients. Two, um, everyone has uh, um, a gown and uh, and gloves, and that that isn't much changed from normal. I'll pause there and just make a point that because of the way dialysis is organized, it is so it, it is so careful on um, on surface decontamination and ha hand hygiene uh, that what we want to do here is change just a little bit just those things in response to what we're seeing in the community and what we're seeing in the outbreak so that the teams can adapt to what they're seeing locally and what we're seeing nationally. Um, all of those steps that I just outlined are, are industry-wide steps, a little bit different from some providers to others, but in general, the, uh, the same general approach. Uh, one more, uh, uh, one more, Community-wide response, I think that that uh, makes uh, sense and help, helps you think about this is uh, cohorting of patients by risk group. So there are patients who are we know are uh, have been exposed with prolonged or close contact uh, with a known positive patient or a known positive individual in the community. Um, and those go, um, and if they are asymptomatic, they are tracked and, and put in a separate um, cohort uh, um, and, and, and uh, approached differently than other patients. Also separate are, are anybody who is symptomatic but untested. Symptomatic, untested is presumed positive until, uh, until proven otherwise. That means they either got tested or they run through a non-test based uh, set of criteria for return to the general population. And then the third, of course, is the known positive patient. And they too have the CDC defined uh, uh, means of exit uh, from that um, time based on the one hand and test based on the other hand. So far, so good. What uh, what we're seeing across the country um, then is um, at the end of last week, I think there were 550 patients reported by CASER, total dialysis patients in the United States uh, who had been tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, mind you, this is in the absence of widespread testing. So we don't know what that number, what the true number is but it's going up rapidly, as you would expect. Uh, the numbers in New York City dominate, um, but uh, in, in order after New York City, uh, the New Orleans area, Louisiana, Georgia, and then California are, uh, are fill out the, the, the top four cities in the country. The last bit um, to make help you make sense out of your markets is that those cohort cohorting, in particular the, the untested symptomatic patient and the tested positive patient uh, are uh, now being put into uh, either uh, uh, preferably into facilities that are designated for those particular cohorts, that is to say assumed positive cohorts, either assumed or tested. And, uh, and um, there is the potential for cross-provider sharing. So if Fresenia sets up a unit in Boston, the Vita facilities uh, can send patients to that, um, positive patients to that facility uh, down in Dorchester. Um, and, and so on across the country. That's, uh, that's how the dialysis industry is organized in order to uh, take care of those patients. How well are we doing? It's a little early to tell. Um, 550 patients out of 500 plus thousand uh, dialysis patients seems like a low number. 
um, but it's incredibly disruptive um, at the facility level, uh, particularly if if uh, if teams, the care teams, are exposed. Uh, what we are seeing, uh, uh, and it's a good sign, is that most facilities, almost all facilities, have only one patient or so at this at this time, or one infected uh, healthcare worker, and and uh, and the number of healthcare workers is uh, is really quite small who are infected. So. I take that as evidence that uh, we're right that the major exposure at this time is uh, is in the communities and not within facilities. That's uh, that's kind of a broad view, Eric, of where we are and uh, and what the dialysis unit, uh, what the dialysis industry looks like right now. Um, as you think about your local area, um, it, you you will have to think about it in terms of where the outbreak is in its development, how fast it's moving, how dense the population is, the availability of testing or unavailability, and the availability of healthcare resources in general, in hospital beds, or not. Um, so all of which is to say, this is, it varies highly by locality. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that overview. I, I must say I'm incredibly impressed by how well the dialysis organizations have done with really preventing this from becoming just like a California wildfire. I mean, I would have thought that this really vulnerable patient population, that this would have just exploded through the dialysis units, uh, but it really seems not to have, and it's, in, it's really impressive how, how well you've been able to contain that. What about staff? Have you had dialysis uh, center staff get infected? And can you tell if that's in center exposure or out of center? Yeah. Um, so exposure, let me just start by saying that exposure in the current environment um, is different than, than we were thinking of exposure just four weeks ago. Um, we, we thought of it four weeks ago as being primarily something that would happen within the dialysis facility. And of course now that's not the case. Exposure is primarily something that's happening in, deep in the communities uh, where this virus is circulating. Um, so to the extent that we know about potential exposure, uh, we can do a risk assessment using the CDC uh, risk assessment tool and define where that healthcare workers should go based on risk assessment. And that the core of those risk assessments are whether the patient was symptomatic or not. Of course, we have control over that because we screen at the front door and whether the, uh, whether the patient and the uh, healthcare worker had masks on at the time. Those are really critical. If those three, if those two things happen, a mask on one and a mask on the other, um, almost all of those healthcare workers can continue to work as long as they are asymptomatic. Yeah. It's kind of a long answer to a short question. Yeah. Well, again, commendable job for cont containing it at this point, and let's hope that that uh, perseveres through this whole crisis. Eric, you want to see if, before we lose David, if any of the panelists have any specific questions for them? Uh, Roy, Prabir? Mm -mm. Yeah. David, no, thank you. Uh, it, it, that, that was a great summary. My question really was that if you're a dialysis unit in a rural area or in an area that's quite far away from other places, and so it's not so easy to designate a shift or a dialysis unit for COVID-19 patients, uh, what are your thoughts about taking one end of the dialysis unit and convert into a COVID-19 section? And that's important, obviously, if it spreads out uh, all over the country. Yeah, yeah. M my 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 view of that is don't put those don't put positives or PUI symptomatic. That is. It, persons under investigation with symptoms uh, together on the same shift and don't put th those either of those two together with unaffected patients. Um, whatever you do, um, the point that you make is that in both urban environments and in 
and in rural environments, facilities are so much different from each other. They just, um, you have to have a local solution that works for that community and works for that facility. Um, so uh, our, our approach generally is to give hard principles. Don't put those people together. Whatever you do, don't put those people together on the same shift because you don't want them coming into the dialysis facility um, uh, and, and spending time with each other in the waiting room. Um, Even if there's just one dialysis unit you'd rec in a 50 or 75 mile radius, you'd recommend that uh, you don't, you would not recommend creating three beds at the end separated by six feet, but you'd rather sending those patients out uh, somewhere. That that would be that would be a last case, the worst case scenario of of creating a chair uh, at the distant end of a uh, treatment floor with unaffected patients on the treatment floor. Yeah. Um, there's a host of reasons why you wouldn't want to do that, um, but uh, but it, but any decisions other than sending the patient to a cohorted facility um, have to be escalated and have higher level intervention and, and assessment about whether that's safe or not. So we give the general principles. We say work out what you think is possible and best for you. And then if it's not option A, bring it back and we will decide whether you can do that or not or make tweaks. Hey, David, I know you're going to sign off, and I just wanted, before you go, uh, address some of the s sort of statements and concerns about access creation, because that's a big thing for us, obviously, in the surgical community. How, how important is it to you at DeVita at this point to get patients off of catheters? Yeah. Um, Maybe an I'll, unfair I'll question. Answer, I'll answer from my uh, role as the nephrology lead for infection control. Um, our our catheter-associated bloodstream infection rates now are uh, are are low. Um, they're they're a bit higher than uh, for uh, an AV graft, uh, and higher still than uh, AVF, of course. But I think with with the use of ClearGuard, which we have now as a as a universal cap rod um, system, uh, our our rates are low enough. Um, that uh, I'm, I'm personally comfortable uh, with, uh, uh, with catheters in place uh, for the short term, uh, riding this out, buying time, and then deal with, dealing with those in the long term if under local conditions um, there are, uh, there are um, really extenuating circumstances and you, and you can't you can't get those catheters exchanged for uh, a functioning AVF or AVG. Dave Mahoney will be much better on on that point with me, but from an infection standpoint, um, yeah, uh, it, and if our job right now is to buy time, um, then uh, and I would say, uh, yeah, I can live with that personally. Great. Well, thank not, not sure that that's a, that's a shared view of the whole community. No, it's helpful to hear, though. Thank you so much for offering that. Um, yeah. so, so thank you again for joining us. I know you have other conference okay. calls you need to get on and such, and really appreciate you being with us today. Terrific. Um, let me just Thanks, briefly. Uh, in, yeah, absolutely. Bye. Uh, let me just briefly introduce the other people that you're probably going to see on your screen. Uh, Bart Dalmach is an interventional radiologist who runs CETO, which is really a fantastic uh, dialysis-focused meeting. If any of you guys see that, uh, Dave Mahoney is from DeVita as well and runs RMS Lifeline as well as our hospital group. Tim Fletter is an interventional nephrologist, also does general nephrology. He's been a big part of ASDIN uh, and really helps uh, shape a lot of what we do. Um, Sarin Chinoy has been the former president of the VASA, Vascular Access Society of the Americas, uh, which is a group that I've been part of as well and is a transplant surgeon at WashU. Uh, Gerald Bethard uh, has joined us, and I think many would consider Gerald one of the fathers of interventional nephrology um, and has really been an influential person in this space for a long time. Uh, Prabir Wari Chaudhry, uh, to those who work with dialysis or are familiar with him and his work on biology of uh, AV access and, and many things with that. And Matt Seidman's joined us as well as a vascular surgeon from San Antonio. 
I was actually part of the vascular surgery uh, group that works with uh, uh, CMS and such to uh, have value appropriation, et cetera, and does a big uh, volume of access. I'm just going to run through some slides briefly that show uh, what it is that uh, we're talking about, why I think this is so controversial. A big part of my practice is dialysis access, and I'm getting just bombarded with emails and texts and phone calls about what do we do with dialysis access procedures in this COVID-19 crisis, and I think we're getting lots of different directions. So probably one of the first things I saw was this, was this joint statement from ASDIN and VASA which is pretty well thought out, I think. And as you go through it, uh, it will just kind of highlight a few things. And one is that they said that they would urge uh, local and state governments as well as state ho as hospital administrators to categorize dialysis access procedures as tier 3A and B with local uh, locations at all those facilities. And that procedures performed to maintain functional access patency or transition a catheter patient to a non-catheter patient uh, really helps reduce morbidity and mortality. And that for sure has been one of the talking points in the whole dialysis community for a long time as a, as a nationwide push to do that. Um, so shortly after it actually that 3A and 3B made more sense to me because shortly after that I opened the email from American College of Surgeons. I would really let out this uh, guidance statement uh, about different types of cases during this time. And if you scroll down through vascular surgery, which has helped uh, be structured by the SVS, uh, they went through dialysis access and, and went from this grade three where they said you shouldn't postpone, meaning ruptured aneurysms, gold legs, et cetera, and, and went for non-functional access as high. Uh, and then down at 2A, or sort of the almost, uh, almost don't even think about doing it, was this, uh, you know, consider postponing your graft and fistula placements, uh, in particular for pre-dialysis patients. Uh, and then just last week, we came out with this ASN announcement where they referred to a communication with CMS uh, that came out with this saying that, you know, placement or repair of the fistulas, grafts, access modalities, mm -hmm. et cetera, was essential. And it's essential for establishing vascular access in this population to receive their life sustaining therapies. And that, that's challenging. In Texas, I can tell you, we've had something else come out which was really alarming to the local <coughs> practitioners that Matt could also attest to. And that was this uh, notice from the Texas State Medical Board and signed by our uh, governor, uh, Greg Abbott, that came through and said, postpone all surgeries and procedures that are not immediately medically necessary to correct a serious medical condition, preserve the life of a patient who without the immediate performance of the surgery or procedure will be at risk for serious adverse consequences or death. Uh, and then it goes on even stronger and says that this rule amends the definition of continuing threat <coughs> to public welfare to include actions specifically prohibited uh, by this order as it relates to surgeries and procedures and amended the rule for peer review to require immediate reporting to allow for the board to move immediately to utilize disciplinary authority. Um, so that, of course, was really striking to those of us who practice um, here in Texas to say that basically if you were doing access procedures uh, that, that would be really concerning. Um, so, so with that in mind, it's, it's been pretty rough to say which direction do we take and how do we move forward on that. Um, so maybe we can just go to Prabir and talk about the sort of ASN, ASN announcement and, and the CMS uh, communication. Right. No. Thanks, Eric. So that was a really good overview. So I'm going to start off by saying that whatever guidelines are out there, I think they have to be adjusted to the local situation. And in this day and age, the local situation is the amount of COVID-19 there is. Uh, I just spoke with a close friend and we were fellows together uh, uh, 20 years ago and he's the head of nephrology. Uh, at Mount Sinai West, and uh, about a half of his hospital is COVID positive. That's a totally different setting from UNC, where we've currently only had nine COVID patients within the system. So I think where you are with regard to the COVID pandemic, uh, the amount of PPE that's out there in the hospital, uh, the total amount of staff that's available, I think all of those things have to be factored in when you're making a judgment or an assessment about whether a dialysis vascular access procedure is urgent or not. Uh, I, moving on from there, and, and so keeping that in mind, I would say that uh, if you're perhaps on going up on the curve or you're going down on the curve or your curve is flat, then uh, uh, clearly 
you could be doing procedures, uh, not elective procedures for sure, but if you've got a vascular access that's doing really badly, potentially you could fix it. My view, and I'm putting on my hat and my opinion, and it's very much in keeping with what David Van Wick said. I think if you've got somebody with a catheter in place in this time, at this time, I'm not sure that I would aggressively rush in to fix a fistula that is having some problems. Now, again, if you've got no COVID cases, that may be an option. But if you don't, or if you do, then I think a catheter is a very reasonable form of dialysis at this point in time. If you've got a lot of COVID cases and if you're being whelmed by COVID cases. Uh, and I will stop there and uh, uh, see if there are questions from you, Eric, or comments from others on the panel. Yeah, I guess I would open that up to the panel and the other panelists have a question for that. Siren. I, I can't agree with uh, Prabir as well as David more. I think the key here is what is your local situation and what are the risks for the patient? Now, one, we are not talking about those access cases which have to be done, like a thrombosed access. You, don't, you need something for access. We are not talking about that. We are talking about patients who need, an, no, we are not talking about patients who are CKD who can probably wait for another week, two weeks, or a month or two months. We are talking about patients who are getting dialyzed with a catheter who have an access problem which need to be fixed. Or we are talking about patients who are getting dialyzed with an access which has a problem which is coming in the way of their access function which needs to be fixed. Now, if you look at that group, I think it is the matter of trying to weigh the pros and cons of doing it. And that depends entirely on your local situation. So there are accesses with patients with the catheter who have a new access. If you don't intervene on them, you know this is not going to mature at all, or if at all, it goes to the other direction of non-maturation. So you have to intervene. Then you look at your local situation, and if you have enough resources, you don't have much COVID patients around, or patient is not coming from COVID endemic or prevalent area. So all those things go into decision making. I can only think about one downside for doing these cases at this point is if you are hard pressed for PPE, you are with every case utilizing the PPE. Again, depends on the local situation. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Uh, so next, I'm just going to go to Alan Lums and my partner for a minute. Uh, last Friday, we ran a town hall with SVS, uh, with leadership there from across the country. And some of the messages from some areas of the country, of course, were quite stark. And it was honestly one of the most uh, motivating, <laughs> eye-opening things that I've heard of. Um, you know, it was, it was really striking to hear it. And one of the challenges, of course, is it's so dynamic, right? Because two weeks ago, I was already going on a ski trip with my kids for spring break. And, you know, now here I am wearing a mask sitting next to my partner but right. six feet away because of uh, social isolation issues and such. So, Alan. You want to talk about the meeting? Yeah, a couple of things. If we can get my slides up, please. But before, while we're waiting on that, uh, we want this to be interactive, not just with the panel, but also with the audience. And so if you text, the number to, to text is 37607, 37607, and then type in DeBakey. What that will allow you to do is text in questions that you have, and we will put them up on the board here and use this panel to try and answer as best we can some of those questions. Please, if you can, keep the questions to our area of expertise. We're really not the experts in managing COVID in general, and I know there's a lot of concern about this. The second thing is we're going to pose some questions to you, and I think it would be very helpful if we have some idea, for example, of what our audience actually is, who makes it up. And so please help us by, uh, the number is 37607, and they type in DeBakey, and that'll allow you to send in these questions and also answer the questions which we're going to pose to you. So if we can have my computer back up. We're going to play you a snippet uh, from when, from the town hall on, uh, we did it last Friday, and we're going to hear from Ben Starnes. We had two surgeons who are really in, uh, considered to be the epicenter. Ben is up at the University of Washington in Seattle. 
um, and Dr. Darren Schneider actually called in. We're not going to show Darren from New York. And they were just really emphasizing kind of what's been said actually about prioritizing based upon the phase of the disease. So let's let this run and listen to Ben. I think we all have to kind of take a pause here and look at what's better for society. These patients, in my mind, can get a tunnel mine and continue to get hemodialysis, but these are the most vulnerable patients. If they're exposed to the COVID-19 virus, they have a significant chance of dying from it. That's a life and death situation. I understand that they're on hemodialysis, but I believe that we're potentially uh, not only using resources that could be used for others, uh, but we're potentially, um, you know, uh, not not in line with what we need to be in line with right now. So we're not doing urgent. We'll do ulcerated dialysis access if there's a concern for blowout, if there's an infection, something like that. But we're not doing new uh, hemodialysis cases or fistula placement. Okay, so I also wanted to show you some of the questions and answers that we got from the SVS. And that was, are you experiencing shortage of protective personal equipment, the PPEs? Only about 57% actually said yes. But that's one of the drivers for the concern in doing a lot of cases. Second question we posed, if you own or operate an office-based lab, are you, and you can see the answer is limiting cases to limb salvage and access. That then spurred on a whole series of questions about whether a lot of these cases that we're not going to do in the hospital could be pushed into the OBLs. That brought on a whole secondary series of questions about reimbursement. Uh, the last question was, have you, and this was kind of shocking to me, have you or your partner had to go into quarantine? And about 30% you know, have been directly affected by this in their practice. So that, that, that's a huge issue. Now what we really want to do, so the second one question, or last question was, do you anticipate being asked to provide non-vascular COVID related care? And 63%, I can tell you that here, um, all our intensivists have been pulled out of our ICUs. So we're going back to the way we used to practice. And that is we, as of two days from now, we will be completely responsible for the ICU care and the entire care of our post-operative patients. And that is so we can move the intensivists uh, into the, uh, the COVID units. So let's see if this works. If Fernando, if you can pull up this question, because we'd really like to know who's watching this webcast. And so the question is, my specialty is A, nephrologist, B, surgeon, C, interventional radiologist, D, cardiologist, and E, none of the above. We able to kind of talk while we're going? You can talk, yeah, talk yes. right now. So yeah. Bart, I know that you also have time constraints. Maybe while that poll's coming up, you could Sort of tell us about California and radiology community and where you guys are at. Thanks. Thanks, Eric and Alan uh, and the panel. It's uh, first off, I'd say that I probably don't have uh, the entire finger on the pulse speed of all of California, but I can tell you that, uh, as mentioned before by Prabir and others, uh, this is a very local phenomenon. Um, our hospital, uh, as of a couple of days ago, had three COVID patients in a hospital of about 300 beds, you know. Uh, other hospitals here, we're told, have uh, as many as 50% of patients COVID positive. So I think, again, it comes down to the very local nature of this. One of the things I wanted to mention was the uh, concern I have about screening. Uh, you know, there are people at the front door of my clinic and of the hospital, and they ask patients, you know, they ask them to put a mask on, and they ask if they have a cough or fever. The other day, I had a patient show up in my clinic who uh, went through the screening and was uh, sitting in a room waiting for me. Um, not a dialysis patient, but a patient with a lung infiltrator mass. And it turned out the patient had been coughing and had just turned up with a positive quantifuron. And somehow they got past the screening. I, I don't think that we can screen vigorously enough right now. And that's really something that oftentimes falls to people who aren't, I think, not um, as well trained as we could have them being trained. Uh, so really attention to the front door is the, the first line of defense, I think. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Have you done anything to limit patient contacts with staff now in your practice that is different than before? Uh, well, for sure, you know, the waiting room is, uh, is not happening. We are doing video conferences on almost everyone uh, for uh, 
uh, intake, that is new, new patients, as well as for follow-up, the only patients that we schedule to be seen at all by our staff or by ourselves are patients who absolutely have to have something done procedurally uh, and who cannot wait. So uh, I think in that way, we're really mitigating the contact with staff and with, with staff, with physicians, with anybody uh, at all by keeping people outside the clinic, outside the hospital, uh, if at all possible. Uh, as far as uh, uh, staff, I mean, we have an entire, I, I most of my patients as outpatient, dialysis patients as outpatients in the hospital. Uh, and uh, so we have a very robust uh, intake unit that's uh, established many precautions. I'll tell you that that's not just up to me and in my own clinic, that's a hospital based uh, program right now. Right. Okay. So if you come back, you want to look at the, the results of this question, if we can pull that back up, you can see about uh, two thirds of the audience are surgeons, 7% nephrologists, 25% uh, none of the above. Uh, so let's go on to the next question is because I know we're starting to get into the meat of it. I can tell you that the text questions and there's going to be an opportunity once we stop with these multiple choice questions, there's an opportunity to send in text questions. Many of the text questions that come into the SVS, clearly the surgeons felt they were under a lot of pressure uh, to go ahead and do procedures that they really didn't think should be done. In fact, there was a request from the SVS, we need a document so we can, uh, we have something to hold up because uh, uh, they felt like under a lot of pressure from the dialysis community. So let's kind of look at uh, some of these questions. Other than ulceration, hemorrhage, infection, this is a <coughs> statement. The only procedure which should be performed during the COVID crisis is a tunnel dialysis catheter. That's a straightforward true false. And then we'll go into what the procedure should be. So go ahead, keep talking, so, Eric. Well, so this perhaps as that uh, poll is accruing, maybe we can go to you, Tim, and talk about your practice situation and what this has meant, because you practice in a different environment than most of us. Maybe kind of describe your practice and what you guys are doing at, at this time. Sure, Eric, I'm glad to. So I'm in a practice of 18 nephrologists and two surgeons. Uh, we do uh, full service dialysis care as well as dialysis access care within the practice, um, both open surgical procedures and endovascular procedures. And we do that in the hospital as well as in a freestanding ambulatory surgery center. Um, I could, I, I fully agree with the comments made so far that you have to think locally and you have to think day to day in terms of what we do because the situations um, happening so quickly. Uh, I would say that there are three things that should guide our three priorities that should guide our decision making. First, we have to provide dialysis for our, for our end stage kidney disease patients who need it. Uh, so there are a number of procedures that fit in my view fit into um, that priority and they should be done. I would not agree with the comment that we'd put a tunnel catheter in uh, in a patient with a thrombosed access compared to uh, performing a thrombectomy uh, because uh, for us, we can, we can do a thrombectomy in pretty much the same time um, with the same response uh, as we can do a tunnel catheter. Uh, so there are procedures that fall into maintaining access and that's first maintaining dialysis and that's first priority second priority i'd say uh, agreeing with david wick is uh, that uh, uh, we need to protect end-stage kidney disease patients um, from covid infection and there are procedures in my view that fall into that category uh, our priority is to get patients home the dialysis facility while we're doing everything we can to screen patients, uh, they are not as safe in our dialysis facilities as they are if they're at home. So we will do a PD catheter over, um, over a tunneled catheter if we can place a patient at home where they're going to be safer. Um, uh, we're certainly delaying some procedures however, because of the priority of protecting patients from ESRD. And we're also separating in our minds the, the risk when we ask what procedure to do, there's a relative risk at the hospital that's higher because of the prevalence of COVID-19 in Illinois right now in the hospital than the relative risk in the ambulatory surgery centers. So deciding whether we proceed with something 
um, uh, we're a little more currently a little quicker to proceed with that procedure at the ASC as compared with the hospital. And then last on the priority in my view would be avoiding complications of dialysis access. I think uh, that certainly is last and patient with a good functioning catheter uh, and an access that we might otherwise intervene on because, of, uh, because it's immature or because of complications. Um, we're, we're delaying those, uh, what we would term to be elective um, cases, uh, but that's a case by case basis. Yeah, that's great. So Tim, can I ask a couple of follow-up questions on that? I guess one question is like, how big is your facility? Like how many people do you employ there and such? And do you feel like that really protects you and the patients better from COVID exposure than with a big hospital? And then secondly, when you're doing your PD, are those patients getting intubated and having like a laparoscopic PD catheter? Or is this a radiological percutaneous thing with some sedation? Yeah. So uh, our ambulatory surgery center employs about um, 15 people. Um, we have two rooms, uh, not all 15 working at one time. Uh, we handle um, uh, PPE. We have currently adequate supplies of PPE. We coordinate with the hospitals who also are part owners in our ambulatory surgery center. Um, and there certainly could come a point where the, the, the weight of patient care needs to be shifted to the hospital and where we would close um, in order to uh, provide us uh, PPE to the hospital or where we would begin to take on hospital type work that we aren't currently doing. So we're coordinating from a community response standpoint that way. Our role right now is to ensure dialysis patients don't go to the hospital. Um, so make, make sure we can maintain their access. And we're doing, you know, patients mask, we mask, um, uh, even though I'm in my office with the door closed and I don't have my mask up currently. Uh, uh, so we're doing everything we can um, to screen at the door uh, and use PPE to protect. And, and sorry, Tim, your, your PD catheters, and that, those are done with radiological guidance or general anesthesia and laparoscopy? We do them under um, sedation and with uh, either um, fluoroscopy or our, our surgeons will sometimes do an open PD catheter ball, but also under sedation. Yeah. Um, laparoscopic we do at the hospital and we've pretty, not, pretty much stopped doing that um, in, in that complex patient that we need to do that. Uh, we do it, they're gonna sometimes take longer anyway and we do a tunnel catheter. Yeah. You know, it's funny, in our practice, PD catheters, lap PD catheters, probably one of the quickest procedures we do. I, I almost hazard the procedural time from my perspective is the same as a TDC. Um, but of course, I have anesthesia, putting them to sleep and waking them up and going to recovery, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I'm intrigued by the PD push and getting patients out of the dialysis centers. Uh, Dirk Hinchel's also joined us from Brigham and Women's. Uh, he and his partner are running an access clinic today. I might just ask the other three that do PD catheters what their feelings are on the current PD issues and should we push forward with that. Maybe we'll start with uh, Matt Seidman. Matt, I believe you also do PD. I'm not sure. I presume you do that laparoscopically and not with fluoro, but perhaps I'm wrong. Yeah, most of the, a lot of the PD catheters in San Antonio are being done by the interventional nephrologists in their uh, OBL and ASC now. Um, I, I don't do as many <laughs> nowadays as I used to, but I did them all um, in the hospital laparoscopically with anesthesia. And, and it brings up a, a good point you, where you were saying the times aren't great to do those procedures, but you're creating more risk by uh, employing more people in an operating room, an anesthesiologist, and the actual intubation and extubation of these patients creates a lot of aerosolizing. Those are aerosolizing procedures, and that's some of the highest risk for transmission for COVID. And it's not just at the intubation in the operating room, but it's also uh, aerosolizing in the recovery room for patients who are coughing and have face, net, uh, face tents, and they're potentially spreading COVID to uh, providers uh, and other patients in the recovery room. So uh, just talking with some anesthesia colleagues, the recovery rooms have become very problematic about how to uh, social distance and how to limit risks in those areas. So um, I, I, I think it, I, it's a good point that if you could dialyze patients at home with PD, that's probably the safest method. And the trick is how to get them a PD cath 
safely and, and uh, for people that are offering it in an ASC or an, an OBL under sedation, that's probably the best way to do that right now. Yeah. Um, before we go to uh, Seren and uh, Dirk on that, we're just going to go back to our question for a second. And I kind of wonder if this question suffered from not having thrombectomy on there, right? Because thrombectomy was not actually listed. But, you know, most people that responded anyway agreed that, yeah, outside of these things, it looked like something that could turn into something really threatening to the patient with either bleeding or infection, et cetera, that they'd say really, really reserve cases to that alone at this point. Um, so let's go on to, to the, pull the next question up. <coughs> Um, this one's a little more complicated. What it's going to say is the procedures which should be performed during a COVID crisis are a new, now you can vote more than once here. This is a little different. You can actually choose multiple of these. New fistula, new graft, intervention for graft maintenance, intervention for fistula maintenance, tunnel dialysis catheter. So you can choose up to five if you think all of these should be, should be being performed or you can prioritize them. So why don't you start continuing the discussion while we're pulling this up. Once yeah. we close down these questions, then you're gonna be able to text in your, uh, your text questions directly. So, Saran, I'm going to go to you next then. You're in a little bit of a different practice environment. Maybe you can talk about what the COVID exposure is and your current approach both for PD and then your access practice. I know this morning you did a superficialization that uh, most of us are not doing at this time. Um, okay, let me preface by saying that uh, we are, our practice is constantly changing, just like anybody else, in terms of uh, what we are doing and what we are not doing. For example, what we did, if I go through my list of what things we, I did three, two weeks ago for access, are not, probably won't be the list for coming weeks if the same patients were available. So things are changing. It's not like by any means that this is what I'm going to do. But at this point of time, based on the low prevalence of COVID and based on the risk profile, we are doing access procedures in selected patients. Like uh, to give you an example, the superficialization, which I was talking about, is in a patient who has had a fistula ready to go within three weeks of placement. Only reason it's not available is the patient is pretty obese. So you superficialize within next two weeks. Patient will be off the catheter and patient has already had two catheter related infections. Patient comes from a local COVID prevalence area, lives by herself with the, her son brings her in. They're very well educated and they know they had no exposures. We are not, we don't test these people while coming in at this point of time. So I have another patient who's coming up day after tomorrow who had a thrombosed fistula, which is functional. And I'm going to open it up because if I don't open it up now, I don't know if I postpone him, how long this is going to last. And I know for sure, if I leave it for next two months, I won't be able to open it up. So it depends on ent entirely on cases, but I, I am, let's look at the other side of it. I mean, catheter is not without problems. A well-functioning catheter is okay, but I don't know when that patient is going to get a stenosis developing. I don't know if the patient gets a risk a catheter infection, the risk may be low, but if it gets an infection, mortality is anywhere between 4 and 10 percent for infection. 15 days of hospitalization. So there are significant risks. It's not like they are not without risks by doing catheter. So I think decision making becomes totally individualized in a given patient. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a salient point. So let's go to the poll results and just see what that looks like. Um, so it's a little bit hard to know if people are completely interpreting this, right? Does this mean swollen arms they would do or not do? You know, what the maintenance procedures are, but obviously from the people that are responding, it looks like lots of people would uh, say to really just get their acute needs met. But I'm a little surprised, new fistulas, 8%. Intervention for graft maintenance is higher than intervention for fistula maintenance. I would have thought it would be reversed, actually. But I kind of wonder if fistula maintenance intervention might be somebody saying they've got a non-maturing fistula and they would not do interventions for that or not do a second stage transposition. It depends on how people interpreted that. Um, so next I want to go to, uh, to Matt and Gerald because both you guys are at places where there are more than one facility at the place you work. So Matt has a big university hospital he works at and also a smaller community hospital and Gerald's now with UTMB which has multiple facilities. And I guess the question is, 
if we're going to do some of these procedures, should we be shifting them away to the smaller hospitals within our systems? Matt, do you want to address that first? Sure, I'd be happy to address that. And I, I, I think that kind of dovetails nicely into the discussion about how people should be making the decisions based on what their local environment is. If, if your uh, resources are still good and you have a low prevalence of COVID, um, then we, we should probably be able to be doing some of these things that in other areas where they're overwhelmed, they're, they're not able to do. Um, the, the real question is, uh, nobody really knows when they're going to get hit with a surge. It's, it's kind of like we're all kind of waiting to be overwhelmed like some of our other areas are. And we don't know if the measures that the government's taking with social distancing um, will, will impact that or not. The, the first thing, and I'm maybe off topic a little bit here, that I saw that might indicate we're having an, a, an impact is related to something that Ben Starnes put up in the town hall on Friday, where there's a website that's predicting based off of uh, reported data by state and, and in the US when uh, the predicted surge or peak of patients and peak deaths will be. Uh, and just looking at Texas on Friday, the prediction for the peak in the state of Texas was April 18th. And now that's already moved out to May 3rd. So we seem to be hopefully flattening the curve in certain areas. And then the question will become, do we practice the same? Should we continue to cancel all private, uh, all elective procedures and stockpile PPE if our curve is flattened and we're not predicted to have an overwhelming surge that will overwhelm our capacity to provide healthcare? Because if we've been successfully able to flatten the curve where we have enough resources, then we shouldn't be so restrictive as far as only doing emergent procedures. Uh, unfortunately, here in Texas, as you know, the governor basically with his uh, executive order limited us to only tier three A and B procedures, which puts a little bit of a restriction on what we can do here. Whereas uh, other areas, I think it's more important to be able to um, be able to take cases on a case by case basis. And that's where um, larger health systems and community hospitals could work together. As you said, I work for the University of Texas and we have our large university hospital, which is our uh, level one trauma center and they are preparing for the disaster uh, to use, utilize all their capacity to take on the huge surge um, that, that is projected to hit San Antonio. The problem is I think a lot of the hospitals, including the community hospitals in town, are taking kind of the similar approach where every hospital is preparing to take on a huge surge and only do COVID-19. I think we could take a lesson from uh, the dialysis centers where they're sharing patients and, and uh, allocating resources where you can uh, sequester the positive patients into one area. And that would be a great area, a, a great utilization of a smaller community hospital. Like I do probably three quarters of my procedures in a 140 bed hospital um, where if, if we could keep the COVID patients out of there and make that quote a clean hospital, then we could still be doing elective procedures in that, in the right um, legislative environment. I would echo that. I mean, I, I've really kind of wondered when I've talked to people locally, regionally who are working at really tiny hospitals doing their stuff, it really makes me wonder if, if that couldn't be a safe place to do it, if you're right, if we could follow the lessons from the dialysis centers, et cetera, and have that work. Gerald, can you talk about Galveston, UTMB, and are you guys shifting things to your smaller facilities because you're kind of streaming all up and down the freeway? Well, you know, basically our program here is just uh, kind of in an infancy stage and we're just beginning, but, but we're trying to shift uh, procedures as much as possible to smaller hospitals. And I think what uh, Matt just said is, is, is well worth mentioning. Uh, th there's one other thing that I, I think that, that ought to be mentioned. Uh, I uh, talked to someone this morning that uh, is uh, very uh, intimately involved with the American Association of Kidney Patients. Uh, and um, it's Terry Litchfield actually, and she's a patient advocate, as you probably know, and, uh, is she, and she is answering a lot of calls from individual patients. And, uh, and, and she mentioned three things that she is seeing that is causing quite a problem. Uh, one uh, is uh, related to patients 
being turned away from hospitals who have, uh, for example, a thrombofield actually, and she's a patient uh, advocate, as you probably know, to the hospital is scheduled for a procedure, but when they get to the hospital, they're told that the procedure has been canceled, uh, and they really don't know what to do at that point. And and, uh, by the time they get back to the dialysis unit uh, and have someone uh, take on the task of making a disposition on them, uh, they've missed several dialysis treatments, and then they go to an outpatient center that doesn't want to handle them because they're concerned that they may have hyperkalemia because of mistreatments. And I think that that's, that's a, a very uh, serious problem. The other issue relates to patients missing treatments. Uh, a lot of, uh, in, especially in rural areas, uh, what is being seen is patients are hearing uh, from the federal government, from state government, to uh, uh, to stay at home, to, to not go out in public, and they don't realize uh, necessarily that that doesn't relate to their dialysis treatments, and so they're not going to dialysis treatments. And when the inquiry is made, they're being they're replying, "Well, I was told to stay at home." And then the other issue is, uh, some of these rural patients uh, have to travel some distance to get to the dialysis unit, and uh, they are dependent upon volunteers to transport them. And these volunteers are wanting to stay at home or in some cases are, are ill and can't transport them. And so we're seeing a lot of patients missing treatments. Yeah, yeah, clearly dialysis patients missing treatments is, is, is the thing we're really trying to avoid, right? Uh, as, as priority number one, I think is exactly as Tim said. Uh, Dirk, you want to talk about how you guys are managing this situation and continuing any procedures and trying to keep everybody safe? Well, we can yes. hear you. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm here. You can hear me. I know. Uh, yeah, we can. So yes. we uh, in in Boston we have a we have we have for already in place a system where most of our dialysis access patients, over ninety percent, are done in a community hospital that is away from the large tertiary care center and it's hospital outpatient uh, based. And um, fit or following into the thoughts of creating local patterns of care that optimize the resources that you have, um, we envision that we continue doing as many procedures that we can in this setting. We have two <coughs> procedure rooms, have separation of COVID suspected or positive patients, which really we haven't had any so far, um, and um, non-COVID population with the goal to keeping dialysis patients out of the hospital as a vulnerable population as, as uh, was um, described before. I think uh, Tim very aptly or very knowledgeably categorized procedures. Um, and we, at this point, have not seen a surge. And so we are trying to do as much as we can before that surge comes. And uh, you know, we, uh, we talked about PD catheters, I think yesterday by phone, and uh, we are similarly trying to still do PD catheters. Those are done at the tertiary care center and uh, there are pressures against this, but our tertiary care center also has not seen the surge yet. The point that, that, or in my mind, is that if we have a commitment to ESRD patients and we make the decision that we do not ration care to certain subgroups within the overall population, then it probably would be good and useful to dedicate within a region certain centers that continue to do access care while other centers do not do this anymore so that you don't have duplication of efforts. Um, tying a little bit into what, what Matt Seitman was saying, um, uh, and these have to be conscious decisions though. Uh, it, this is a moment where if every hospital system, and in Boston we have like six universities that all have enormous pride issues or pride uh, to, to do things themselves, mm. this is the moment where you kind of have to get over this and say, okay, we're going to give up certain things, but we're going to focus on on these other things to just preserve functional clinical services. 
Yeah, yeah, I think those are really great points. It's just challenging to make that work, obviously, in certain communities for lots of different things. All politics are local. Um, yep. it, it does make me wonder in the kind of outpatient setting, and although all the access centers here are running now, is that you know their, their depth of staff is very narrow, right? I mean, they, they don't run with extra people. And for them to have one or two people that get exposed and are ill and are out, is that really gonna wipe that out? And I guess that's one of my main concerns about using the smaller facilities and such like that. Um, Gerald, can I ask, do you have any thoughts on that in terms of how can the access centers adapt or ASCs and such? Well, I, I think again, it's, it's all gonna be dependent upon local situation. Um, you know, I think it's an individual matter. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Matt, Matt, so, given oh, the... Yeah, Eric, sorry, Derek, go ahead. I just comment yeah. on this. So what, it, we are in a slightly different situation that we have hospital attachment, but mm. the staff that works with us is highly and specifically trained and losing one of them, they're essentially not replaceable. And uh, so what we have discussed is mm. to go to a lower staffing census, uh, the minimum staffing census, and keep other people home and rotate them in on a one or two weekly basis to basically reduce exposure, uh, to have, always have a healthy team available. Yeah. So this is something we have not instituted yet, but we have discussed, and there are obvious implications for pay. These are hourly paid um, employees, but those are things that we may have to take into account. The good thing is once somebody recovers from COVID, then they should be employable and usable throughout the crisis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as that number continues to grow, I'm sure we're gonna see lots of uh, COVID recovered patients. Uh, looks like Prabir has got a comment you'd like to make. Yeah, please. Yeah, thank, thanks, Eric. I, I just wanted to uh, emphasize again for your audience what Tim Fledgerer mentioned, that create access should, can you hear me? Now we can, we lost you for a second, but you're back Sorry. with us. So I was just going to emphasize again for your audience what Tim Fledgerer said, that creating new access and fixing it from most access should be done. And I want to emphasize that ASN has been in communication with CMS and access procedures will be considered as tier three procedures with the proviso, of course, that you have to decide what you want to do based on where you are on this curve of COVID. But thrombectomy really, I think, is critically important for our patients. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, could, could I could I comment on that? Go ahead. You, yeah. I think w one issue uh, when it comes to access creation is going to depend upon, in a, again, individualization. Uh, for example, if you have a patient that you look at and, and say uh, uh, this patient's uh, vascular uh, situation is such uh, from your evaluation uh, that I feel very confident that uh, I could create a fistula in this patient and it could be usable in three to four weeks. Uh, putting in a catheter and creating a fistula would be reasonable. But on the other hand, if you have a patient uh, that you look at and say, uh, this is, is, is questionable, uh, I create a fistula, it's probably gonna have to have some uh, uh, salvage work done. It may be weeks to months before it's usable. Uh, then in that patient, uh, putting in a tunnel catheter or a early cannulation graft would be the most appropriate thing for that patient. So I think individualization uh, in this, the creating the access is important in these patients in whom the need is, is imminent. They need to start dialysis very soon. Uh, that's critically important. Uh, but again, individualization as to what's done is also uh, very important. Yeah. And, and I would say, Jerry, that I, I do think, though, that the curve is going to bend more towards tunnel dialysis catheters in, I agree. Yes. Yeah, in the COVID era. Yeah, let's go to Seren next. Seren, you've been patiently waiting. Yeah, uh, I have I have, I have added a little bit here for the discussion in terms of uh, who should be considered. So I think there are, there are many procedures, like Jerry said, even creation. For example, I just can't remember a lady who had just created a fistula just three days ago 
and this was not done because there is a vein which is ready to go. But this is the girl who's 23 years old, who has run out of options. That's why I end up with me and has only one vein. I did a radiocephalic for vein conditioning because in two months, with this fistula when she comes back, it would by no way will be ready for use, but I would have had a lot of veins available for me to do something. If I don't do this procedure at that time point, she will probably not come back to me because she's been having recurrent catheter infections and is running out of places to put a catheter. So I think there are patients where we have to individualize and decide what is to be done. I don't agree with the saying that these procedures should not be done at all under these situations. The second thing also to consider is that this, these procedures, majority of them, are very little resource consuming. We do it under MAC or local. We don't intubate them. It's an outpatient procedure. It's done, you know, so I think resource wise is not much. And if you develop a system where you can keep them safe in terms of not coming into contact with other COVID patients or situations, I think, I think this, these procedures can be done and should be done based on situation. Yeah, yeah so I can tell you like, for me, one of the other influential things is that the surges in this, uh, you know, pandemic and, and here regionally, we've seen these surges in the ICU where the ICUs have had periods where they are doubling their volume within a period of three to four days. And then it's kind of quieted down over the weekend and kind of terrified about what the next wave means and, and how much that's going to change. Um, Dr. Mahoney, you want to weigh in on some of these issues? Yeah, thank you. Uh, clearly, a lot of fantastic points made. Um, I've had a number of discussions with Dr. Marty Schreiber, who's our lead for home therapies. And I think one of the things that has been almost pushed to the side is the thought of placing peritoneal dialysis catheters for patients who've been educated and have chosen that modality. And I think there's a tendency to say in situations such as this, where there's so much urgency, we'll go ahead and put a tunnel dialysis catheter a central venous catheter, and we'll worry about PD later. That is really doing a phenomenal disservice to that patient. Um, the more patients we can get home and treat at home, uh, the better off we'll be. And I think we need to take a few steps back and just look at how are we going to preserve our hospital resources. Uh, a dialysis patient who maybe has a dysfunctional but still moderately functional access by having an intervention is likely not going to show up clotted, not going to show up in the emergency room, not going to have to uh, use hospital resources. Whereas, uh, uh, if they you know, if they are treated more expeditiously, they will be they will be better off. The system will be better off. The infection rate will be down. And one of the really sobering statistics, which I heard at a recent meeting, was that for those who are on home therapies, whether it's peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis, once they are hospitalized, 57% fail to return to their home therapy, which is a really sobering number. And of course, they don't just go to their outpatient facility uh, instantly. There's a delay in discharge from the hospital to make those arrangements. And so I think moving, as Dr. Henschel said, moving to dedicated smaller facilities, certainly using the outpatient, the ASCs, the OBLs, and getting these patients treated with a very minimum uh, utilization of resources is going to preserve hospital resources. Uh, I think we have to look at that very, very uh, closely. And as everybody has said, politics, medicine, you name it, local is, uh, is where things are at, and that the local considerations will make a difference I think for those of you in Texas, it is concerning that there was such a really definitive and strong statement from the governor where uh, physicians are, are really hesitant to perform some of these very needed procedures. And I've had doctors from our Lifeline centers in Texas tell us they're very concerned about doing certain procedures because they're afraid that they're going to have to face these consequences. So with any luck, we'll see a formal notification from CMS that these are considered uh, tier three procedures and help keep our patients out of the hospital. Yeah, absolutely couldn't agree more that keeping these patients out of the hospital needs to be one of our top priorities because they definitely get stuck there. 
Um, you know, I guess I would say to me as a surgeon as well, this has kind of changed how I'm thinking about the access that I'm doing. I'm a huge proponent of radius phallic fistulas, but myself, like others across the country, I wind up needing to do secondary procedures on a chunk of them, right? Whether it's a third or 40% or a little more, it's hard to say. And I'm now seeing back radius phallic fistulas that, you know, need some kind of maturation procedure, and I'm kind of struggling with those, knowing that some of those will be lost. And it's making me think if we can work out our kind of continue to work kind of practice and somehow do that safely, do I need to rethink the accesses that I would do? And I'd, I'd be curious if Matt and Seren would think more about, you know, doing a graft in somebody like that who they're not so sure if the fistula is going to work, whereas before they definitely would have did a, done a fistula. Matt, you want to take that on first? Sure. I, I was thinking about that when during some of the previous comments. Um, I, I think we're all kind of talking pretty much the, the, the sa with the same goal and thought about the approach to access for the dialysis patient. And, and I think it, everyone has said it needs to be individualized, but the goal is really uh, to get a reliable access that will last through this epidemic. The problem is we don't really know uh, how long that epidemic is, is going to last. Uh, and the, pro the projection models uh, are ever changing. And it also, like I was saying earlier, if we flatten the curve and we lower the stress on the healthcare system, that's great. But we also then prolong the, the possible duration of the, of the epidemic. <clears throat> and it makes this question of how do we dialyze patients and how do we get them reliable access? Um, it, it may potentially extend that window from thinking about four to six weeks to three to six months. And so th that would change some of your thinking with some of this. So my general approach to the patient is what is going to be the most uh, reliable access for them uh, for the immediate uh, future? Um, in some patients, that, that could be a graft. I would personally hate to put a graft in someone that I think has a, a good vein and, and I would plan a graph that would not burn any future bridges if, if possible. Um, but if that patient had uh, no usable vein and we could put a graph that they could be dialyzing with uh, within the next two to four weeks and not need a catheter, I, I think that's, that's a, a perfectly logical approach. Yeah, I, w I would just kind of echo that. I mean, I'm kind of a fan of a mid upper arm graft that goes to the brachial vein, which is a vein that usually doesn't get used, leaves the basilic and cephalic still there. Um, if, if particularly if I would said somebody had kind of shaky veins or somebody I thought I was going to need a stage transposition on, uh, you know, not uncommonly our transpositions wind up staying overnight, which is kind of an issue. So that eats up hospital resources and puts somebody in a bed that potentially you can get around some other way. Seren, is it changing how you think about uh, your access algorithm and are you considering graphs more than fistulas now or, or not really? Uh, my algorithm, I mean, I do both graphs and fistulas, but uh, specifically for COVID, I have not really thought of changing the algorithm because of COVID because algorithm should depend on what the patient needs in the long run. COVID can come and go, but patient is going to be there. If there's a patient who requires something to be done for next 20 years planning, then I have to do what is important. Though I know maybe in 20 days I'll get a graph going or maybe three days I get a early stick cannulation graph. But that is not the question. Will that come on the way of my 20 years of service for this patient? So it depends on individual. But one thing I am considering uh, changing, I have not yet had the situation, of not going to general, but considering a regional block. I'm not a proponent of regional, you know that, but that's a time for different different discussion. But a regional block may be an answer where you don't want to do a generalized, general anesthesia and aerosolized people. So that may be possible, but planning wise, I don't think there is a huge difference in my planning for a given patient. Yep, so you remain sure of the purist in that standpoint. I'd say once you take on regional blocks, you'll never go back, uh, Seren. So you got to get your anesthesiologist on board. Sorry, Jerry, you had a comment. You'll probably yeah, um, come back with, that patient will probably come back in three years with a central stenosis. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you, you know, the, the, the literature would suggest that uh, actually a graft does better than a fistula uh, for about the first two years. Uh, and if you put in a graft uh, in a patient, 
uh, it doesn't obviate the possibility of a radiocephalic later in the course upper arm fistula is actually uh, a, a good possibility uh, secondary to presence of a graft for a period of time as a secondary fistula uh, and, and I'm not advocating grafts over fistulas but I, I think in, in this situation uh, if you have a patient who has an immediate need for dialysis uh, and it's not obvious that you can uh, get a fistula in place in this patient that you can feel pretty confident uh, confident that it's going to be functional within three to four weeks or, or in that neighborhood uh, putting in a graft is is not that big of a, of a downside uh, and I, I realize as, as Sharon mentioned a moment ago you have individual situations uh, that uh, uh, require a, a, a different solution but as a generality I think in these patients under this circumstance uh, putting in grafts and a lot of these patients that we have been putting in fishes in the past is a very reasonable approach. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Jerry. Um, so we're and gonna- would this, uh, And yeah. just be, would you be moving more towards early cannulation grafts in this? In this it, it would depend on, on the patient. You know, you, you have a, you know, uh, again, the literature suggests that the, uh, that the, the uh, 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 early cannulation graft it lasts as long and is as functional as 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 the standard graft but uh you know many people don't necessarily agree with that but you know if you have a patient and you say this patient is going to need dialysis uh but i can put it off a week to 10 days i can put it off two weeks but within the next two weeks they're going to need dialysis uh putting in a, a regular pt expanded ptfe graft uh, would not be a problem but on the other hand you have a patient who comes in uh, you know, today in the emergency room or, or uh, into your office, and it's obvious they need dialysis uh, now, uh, putting in early cannulation graft uh, that can be cannulated immediately uh, seems to me to be the reasonable approach. There's certainly a strong argument for that. I'd have to agree with that. We're going to go to some of the uh, streaming questions that are coming over now, and this is, this is kind of an interesting one, which is talking about, um, you know, reimbursements and where these things can be done. And I think this is actually from a surgeon in New York who's um, a little frustrated by the reimbursements in an OBL versus an ASC being so poor that you really can't uh, you know, financially sustain doing access surgeries in OBL. And in some regions, I guess, ASC uh, accreditation is much harder to attain than OBLs. And the question was, you know, it, could there not be some sort of bump or temporary bump to make it feasible to do these access procedures and OBLs, you know, over hospitals, et cetera? I don't know uh, which of the panelists might be most in touch with that. Matt, maybe, given your work with AS, uh, SVS. Yeah, I always get to talk about the uh, reimbursement issues. It's uh, <laughs> usually a good way to put people to sleep unless they're very uh, tuned into that issue. Um, I, I think it's a very important uh, question to bring up uh, in the broader sense that uh, as far as what we're doing for access and about uh, payment models in the dialysis centers, I, I think that um, we should be communicating with CMS in, in, in this time period of the COVID epidemic. They need to um, lighten up a little bit of the QDOKI guidelines and um, loosen up some of the restrictions on the dialysis units about what percentage of their patients are being dialyzed with catheter. And, and they need to be able to understand that this is uncharted waters and that it won't necessarily be business as usual for the dialysis patient. And they need to loosen some of those uh, restrictions. They've shown that they're gonna do that in other areas. I'm sure most people have seen that they're loosening um, the requirements for the quality um, quality payment program reporting. And so it, it, it seems that they're receptive to that. Um, regarding payment for, I, I saw I was reading the question on the background, payment for endovascular created fistulas um, in the outpatient setting. Um, that's, that's an anomaly right now of the payment systems where you can get paid in a facility for that, but you can't in the non-facility. Um, fixing something like that would potentially be a little bit harder, but again, these are un, uncharted territories and, and un, unfamiliar times. So CMS might be um, receptive to something like that. They definitely want to limit 
um, patient exposure in the hospitals and they want to conserve PPE. And so they very well may be receptive to an argument that, hey, we can do these in our office, but we have to be able to be reimbursed for that. So I think that's definitely um, uh, something to go forward with. And uh, like I was saying before, we really need to take the regional, the local regional situation into the consideration about what's best for our patients. Yeah, I think that uh, those, those are huge issues. And, and I think a lot of it too is, you know, what is this, you know, un unforeseeable supply chain issue going to be, you know, improved, right? Are we going to have enough PPE that we can continue to do these things? Because if we were unlimited there, then we could certainly set up individual towers and such where we can make this work or do those with the OBLs, et cetera. But at this point, the demand seems to be rising for PPE, uh, outstripping the supply source. That, that to me is a real challenge. <coughs> I know, Dr. Mahoney, you have any in insight into that in terms of PPE availability for you guys? And is that improving, getting worse, staying the same? Uh, I think it kind of comes in cycles. We hear that things will be available and then they're not. Um, I understand that there, um, one, one unanticipated uh, supply of masks, for example, is dental practices have really cut back and a lot of those have been freed up. Um, I, you know, we have an enormous supply team that just works round the clock trying to figure out where are things going to come from. We, we certainly <coughs> uh, voiced from hospitals that we work with that we, we dialyze all our inpatients where the patient wears a mask as well as the nurse. Um, had a lot of pushback from hospitals on that, but we've had three circumstances where patients were not even under suspicion, turned out to be COVID positive and had infected a whole group of healthcare providers. So masking patients, you know, the nurse is gonna be in the room with that patient for four to five hours, very important. So we, we have everybody follow the CDC guidelines and uh, PPE is a, is a daily issue for us. Any more? Uh, yes, Prabir. Oh, hang on, Prabir. No, that's okay. I, I, I'm unmuted. Mm -hmm. So, so one additional point, uh, and this is very much a nephrologist point, but I think it's important, and I think it speaks to both preservation of PPE, and I think it also speaks to doing what is best and safest for our patients. And that is that I think nephrologists could need to take a second think, and I think potentially become more liberal in terms or conservative, whichever way you look at it, in terms of when they say that somebody actually needs dialysis. And so trying to maintain somebody with a low GFR with Lasix, and now we have pteromer, and trying to manage them more all the way down to a very low GFR if they can, I think becomes much more important in the COVID era. And because that's going to keep that patient in CKD as opposed to going into all the issues that we've been discussing about. Yeah, 25 questions, <laughs> just run yeah. through them. Okay, great, so let's go to the, one of the other questions. I think the next one up is a really good one. Uh, I have a feeling I know how the panelists feel about this, but it says that if we're uh, an empty rural hospital, do we just shut our doors and not do anything, or should we open these up and help these patients? And I think that for many people that are working at a smaller hospital that is not seeing this in the bigger urban environments, um, you know, should they, should they just kind of push forward with business as usual, um, perhaps with some enhanced PPE? Uh, the, any of the different panelists want to, you guys lift, lift your hands and I'll call on you individually. Yes, Matt. So uh, I, I was reading something very interesting this morning in the AMA mailer that uh, there's still a lot of counties out there across the U.S. that have no COVID patients and 85% of the counties without any COVID patients are rural counties. And so, uh, and I, I've seen this thread in some other discussions as well as a little bit of the, the reverse tertiary care model where we may be needing to send patients from urban centers and from tertiary care centers where there are limited resources out to rural hospitals and community hospitals where they're not as affected by the COVID and take care of patients who are not COVID-19 positive patients where they can still get needed procedures done in these rural communities. Uh, that goes back again to the local coordination and, and, and trying to break down some system barriers and competition barriers between different healthcare systems and hospitals and 
universities to do what's best for the patient. But especially in areas where there where there's not as many patients and not such a great surge, it would be an excellent utilization of resources uh, without limiting urban areas and in, in areas that are larger struck with COVID, limiting their ability to respond to the epidemic. Thanks, Matt. So we originally planned to stream this for an hour and a half. We don't have to stop. And there's a lot, a lot of questions we're going to try to get to. So if some of the panelists have got to drop off, we certainly understand. If you can stay with us, we'll try and get through these questions. Let me handle this one. Question is how I maintain my practical surgical training in front of COVID-19 crisis, isolation and confinement. Let me punt that to there's going to be another SVS workshop this Friday, I think that's going to start to be specifically addressed, and the president of the, the program directors is going to be on there to do that. What about dealing with this technical aspect here, uh, Eric? Do you recommend interventional thrombectomy instead of surgical thrombectomy on native fistulas to reduce the number of personnel involved? Yeah, I guess I would say in, in my practice, uh, that's essentially the same, right? Because it's the same, in, the same number of personnel that do this with interventional procedures or surgical. Um, I think really that probably comes down to more what's the practice setting that you're at. Um, can you guys go to my last slide? Next slide, go back to my thing. Yeah. All right, let's deal with some of these other questions while they're pulling up. Yeah, Eric's slide. Uh, I think we kind of talked a little bit about uh, is it pa if a patient can have a catheter placed in OBL, should we bring these patients to the hospital for thrombectomies and potentially expose them to COVID? Perhaps not. What is the mortality and morbidity rate of end-stage renal disease who contract COVID? That's a great question. I'd be concerned it's significantly higher than the risk reductions of using an AV access over a catheter. So what's the mortality in end-stage renal disease patient with COVID? Yeah, Prabir, are you able to take a guess at that? I, I think, uh, again, it's going to be very individualized, right? If you have, uh, uh, and uh, you know, my sense is that if you have an elderly diabetic, uh, with multiple cardiac issues, uh, that that patient's going to be at much greater risk than somebody who is uh, much younger with polycystic kidney disease. Uh, having said that, I think anybody with end-stage kidney disease uh, is clearly in a high-risk group, uh, uh, is a vulnerable patient because uh, uh, all dialysis patients have some degree of immunosuppression because of their T-cells. Uh, but I, I do not know uh, numbers at this point. I don't think anybody uh, uh, knows what the mortality from the specific mortality from COVID in ESKD patients is. That, that would be probably my guess as well, Prabir. I know that a couple of the early patients in the Seattle area were dialysis patients, in fact, that died. Um, but yeah, I think the number, it's just probably a little too early to know exactly in this cohort. Um, we're able to pull up mics. Yeah, they got your last yeah, slide going to come up. Um, if we can yeah. get that. So a number of questions. I'm not going to. Uh, we're not going to focus on the questions that have nothing to do with COVID. I think what we're trying to do in this discussion is focus on COVID-related dialysis access problems. Um, here, let's take this one. Large academic centers that have not seen a large influx of COVID patients. How long do we wait until we start performing new AV access surgeries? Yeah, great question. Of course, right. Um, Saran, do you want to kind of weigh in on that? Yeah, uh, based on the local situation, I have not completely stopped doing AV access. I've been, I'm continuing to do it, but on case-to-case -case basis, day-to-day -day basis, I'm very open to my patients and tell them that they may get a call that their case is canceled. But uh, as long as we can go, as long as the hospital is okay with that, I think patients who need them should get them. And uh, I don't see a reason why we should stop them under the, the directive from the hospital. We don't have this. You have to stop sort of a deal. Right now, we don't. We have a directive from CMS that you don't have to necessarily put it off. We have ASTN VASA white paper which says you probably should continue doing this because this is important. Even if you look at the mortality morbidity, they have a significant mortality morbidity in this patient without having a permanent access. So. I feel personally probably should continue doing it as long as your local situation allows you to do and you feel it is safe enough to do. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, I think that um, talking to all the panelists uh, leading up to this event, it's really made me think that we need to reconsider how we do with this local regionally, right? And for instance, a patient with hyperkalemia and a thrombosed access, is there some way we can deal with that differently now than we have in the past? 
And I think through Gerald's efforts and the proliferation of access centers, most of those patients go to an access center. But if they come to the hospital, you know, that's a disaster for us, especially in this time, because you're talking about, you know, a three-day admission or something, right? Because they're going to come in, they're going to assess, the labs are going to get drawn, it's going to take two hours. Labs get rechecked, takes another two hours, now it's too high, they can't have their surgery, they get a temporary catheter, they get dialysis that night, maybe, maybe not. The next day the schedule's already full and they get kind of pushed back. It, it makes me think of just local or regional, we gotta work these things out such that we can do it such that somebody perhaps gets an acute care catheter, gets back out to their dialysis center for dialysis and comes either to the outpatient facility or the hospital again for their thrombectomy or, or next step before moving on. I don't know if the panelists can comment on that, Pr uh, Prabir. Yes, I do. Yeah. I, I, again, oh, I, I agree completely. I, I would, I would add that it also again depends on where you are with regard to your COVID curve. When I spoke with my colleague in New New York uh, just two hours ago, he said, "Do whatever you can to keep patients out of the hospital." Right. So patient safety's got to be paramount. Right. Do what if you've got. 70% of your hospital has COVID patients. You don't want somebody coming into the hospital. Go ahead. Mm. You're muted, I think, Jerry. Okay. Now we got you. Okay. It, it seems like in a, in a number of our discussions, uh, a, a point has become very clear. Is that uh, these rules have been made on a global basis, but they don't apply everywhere. It, that there are individual locations, individual patients that represent e exceptions. And it seems to me like if you're in an area where the incidence is very low uh, and, and there, there is, is very little reason at that point in time to change your practice pattern. It's where you're overwhelmed with COVID-19 in the hospital uh, and in the community where these practice patterns need to be changed. But until that point, practicing as usual, uh, I can't see a problem. So let's rapid fire go through some of these questions. Maybe give this one to you, Eric. Any thoughts on second stage procedures? Patients had fistulas established, no need superficialization. When? Yeah, so I think this is the exact status that I'm faced with now because I do stage transposition fistulas and I'm, so I said that I've got several patients now that need some sort of secondary maturation procedure uh, and I'm essentially just holding off on those for now. I mean, I've taken some comfort, I think, in uh, David Van Wick's uh, talk about how much better they're doing with catheters now. Perhaps we're getting a little more Canadian on this side of the border. And although we have uh, catheter patients doing better in avoiding catheter sepsis, but for me now in this environment, I am not doing that. And I think, I think that's the right answer here, but clearly in some other areas uh, where there's not such penetrance and hopefully with you know, the measures put into place, they can avoid that. Um, but, but again, I think we've heard again and again, that's really local regional. Siren, you want to comment on that? Or? No, no, you, you said it well. It's, it's totally a local decision. In your area, you are not seeing the surge. You are seeing more patients now. You have your numbers doubled in two days or two, two weeks. So I think you are prudent to make that decision not to do it. But in our area, it's not the situation. So we are continuing to do those. So can we get our society packs to pressure Congress to have Medicare relax the penalty and tunnel catheter dialysis during this crisis and recovery phase? I think that's a very important uh, issue, and I think uh, SVS and uh, ASN and uh, all the involved societies really should be con commenting to CMS and to um, their Congress about loosening some of these uh, restrictions. Anything to add to that, Prabir? No, I would agree. Uh, I, I would uh, just say that I think it's really important for all the societies that are involved in this area to work together. And, uh, uh, and I think in many ways, this is a great opportunity for all of us to work together at the national society level, but also as David Van Wick was saying between LDOs, as Dirk was saying, potentially between different access centers in the same region. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, I, all, all everyone I've spoken to, I think, has been very open to really coming together. Yeah, great. 
Okay, one more, Eric. Southeast Michigan's a hot spot with 5,500 Ks, 132 deaths. What PPE are the panel using to make sure the vascular surgeons, the interventional radiologists are protected? Nobody wants to take that one on. So I think, I think, so, yeah, I think that really, honestly, most people are not doing the kind of enhanced protection, but are just doing gowns, mask, gloves, and you know, hand washing and and uh, surface decontamination, and not going beyond to doing, you know, the N95s, pappers, etc. Siren. I mean, I know this is a this has not been the CDC directive, but you know, I think universal masking at least for healthcare workers probably is important. Some of, there is a mixed policy between different hospitals. Some some hospitals here have inculcated that. Some hospitals in areas have done that universal masking for at least healthcare workers and hospital patients. So it looks like from the dialysis unit experience, they are now saying that inside unit spread is pretty much very low because they are having masks for workers and patients. Whereas what is infection they're seeing is community acquired where there is no protection. So at least that is my two cents in terms of personal protection. Yeah, we're starting that from tomorrow at UNC. Everybody wears a mask. It, it's been and, very common. He's going to summarize. Mm -hmm. So I have a C19 ESRD patient in the ICU needs CVVH as blood pressure is low. Do we think an AV fistula is good access for CVVH versus placing a catheter? And then we'll have Eric's last summary slide after that. Mm -hmm. Barry, you look like you're ready to jump on that one. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 this, this person needs a catheter. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, sure. uh, yeah our practice is sure. yeah, our and, and I will say that for all um, this. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, but these patients have a huge cytokine storm and so clotting has been an issue. It could be clotting of the of the filter, obviously. And we've had that in the one patient uh, 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 that had COVID-19, uh, uh, but obviously clotting of, uh, you know, previous accesses or catheters could also be an issue. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, we, we essentially never do CVH through a fistula. We always put a catheter in uh, for that, even if they have got a functional fistula. So we just go to my last slide then. Just going to kind of summarize uh, some of the stuff we've talked about. Uh, I put this together prior to us so, coming together. Yeah. So I think I think the message, of course, uh, institutionally and across the nation, is really safety first, right? And for our patients, the healthcare workers and families, that's really critical. And I think all of our healthcare workers are really intensely concerned about this. And hearing hearing the New York physicians and nurses talk about what they do to try and not infect their families uh, just almost bring tears to your eyes. Uh, number two really is providing dialysis access to ESRD patients because clearly they're going to die without dialysis, right? And, and all of us on this call have, have really kind of made it our life's work to try and make sure that they get access and the best access possible. But I guess I would say any access better than no access. And one of the real concerns I think people have had in the background, not just about creating good fistulas and stuff, but just providing some kind of access so they can get back and forth to dialysis and, and keep their life-sustaining therapies to going. One of the things that's really made me think about is really gathering your local communities together to have open discussions about what to do with this. And this is something I'd start now, this kind of got started, is talking to my local nephrologist about, you know, what does this mean? And, you know, are we gonna stop doing procedures? And there's been all kinds of emotions about that, right? From anger to sadness, not much happiness or joy, but, but all the other emotions for sure. But again, you know, in our institution, the way things are now, that's really an issue. But the question is, you know, what can we do to actually make that move forward? And I've, I've taken some heart listening to people like Dirk and Matt and others about, you know, can we move this to an area that's lower risk and lower, you know, exposure? Because in the past, for somebody to come get a fistula by me, they're probably going to touch 20 people that day. Well, that, that could be greatly reduced if you conscientiously do that and streamline that. And I think that's important. But there are lots of players at that table. And it's not just the nephrologists I call it. It's the hospital, interventionists, the access centers we work with, et cetera. And then I think one of the big messages to us, particularly as surgeons, is really to try and keep these patients out of the hospitals and out of the ERs, right? So that we deal with things by the phone. Uh, we try, if we're going to do stuff, we keep that to be things that we think have low complication rates. I think that's crucial. Um, and then really outpatient uh, procedures and dialysis far preferred over inpatient admissions. It's getting somebody in the hospital with hyperkalemia and having them stay for three days, that's just a disaster waiting to happen. 
So uh, accept any closing comments on that, and if not, then I greatly appreciate the panelists uh, getting together to put their time into this and try and get some communication and, and conversations going. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Have a good day, guys. Thank you so much. Very good. Done. Yep. Thanks again.